barrier between where and the home is all these rocks. I can't imagine why that is. Actually, I saw someone, I know, I saw someone who was at a scooter and she had this nice helmet on. And it was probably a motorcycle helmet. And that's the why she was wearing I guess she had a problem with being hit by cars. Again, on the second draw, 
I can get any one of the same four suits, and the probabilities have not changed, all right, because uh, I put the card that I initially drew out and put it back in the deck and reshuffled it. Now what we can do here is the following. We can use this tree diagram to an, uh, answer probabilities much in the same way I did over here. What is the probability of getting a heart on the first draw and a club on the second? Well, what happens on the first and the second draw of a card in this situation, they're independent. That's because I put the card back in and I shuffle it before drawing the second time. <clears throat> so, what is the probability of getting a heart in the first case? It would be a one quarter. What's the probability of a club on the second? That's also a one quarter. Again, the two events are independent, and then the product is one sixteenth. So, in this case, about one out of every sixteen times, I draw two cards from a deck of cards, where the first one is replaced and, and is shuffled before the second card is drawn. About one out of 60 times, I'll have a heart followed by a club. All right, now, let's contrast that with sampling two cards without replacing them. Let's see how we analyze that situation. This involves what is called conditional probabilities. And again, now I have this tree diagram listing all the possibilities. And the portion up here and the portion down here are identical. So if I sample, again, two cards from a deck of cards without replacing them, the first card I draw, the probability it's a diamond is one quarter. The probability is a heart is one quarter and so forth. <coughs> now let's suppose on the first draw I drew out a heart. I leave it out, that's what we mean without replacement, and I shuffle it again and I draw out a second card. The probabilities have changed. This is what sometimes we refer to as conditioning. <coughs> Having drawn out a heart on the first case and leaving it out, that's going to change what happens on the second row. Now if I look at the four suits here, the second time I draw, I'm only going to have 51 cards as opposed to 52. Now if the first card I drew out was a heart, I will still have 13 diamonds out of 51. So the probability of getting a diamond on the second draw in this case is 13 over, or 13, uh, 51, or 50, yeah, 51. What's the probability of giving a heart? Well, if I, the first card drawn out is a heart, then I only have 12 remaining, 12 out of 51, that's the probability. Now for clubs and spades, the probabilities are again 13 out over 51 because, again, I, I know on the second draw there's still 13 clubs and 13 spades, and so these would be the probabilities. Now in this case, what is the probability of getting a heart followed by a club? Same as the situation here. I do basically the same thing, except the second probability is replaced by what we call a conditional probability, which I'm going to discuss here uh, in a moment. The probability of getting a heart on the first draw and a club on the second is equal to the probability of a first, uh, a heart on the first, times the probability of a club on the second given a vertical line uh, is expressed by the word given, given I had a heart in the first. Well, probability of a heart, first draw is one fourth. Probability of a club in this situation is 13 out of 51. I can simply take the product of these two probabilities, and the probability here is 13 out of 204. Uh, 
which is not the same as this. They're going to be about the same, but they're not exactly the same. Okay. This is an example of conditional probability. And uh, of the, um, I'm going to give you a, another way of thinking about that, or a more formal way. But this is a nice way of thinking about it and how it arises. I think what I'm going to do here, I've used all these terms, and uh, let's talk about the law of large numbers. I guess that should, there should be an S here. Well, what do we mean by experimental? Alright, so the probability you have a condition is uh, so that's in other words about one out of every 70 women in their 40s will develop breast cancer okay so one divided by 70 oops I guess I'm gonna have to compute this one divided by 70 Okay, so all I've done is I've determined the, the, I've written in the probability of the condition, which is about this, and then one minus that is the probability of not having that condition. All right, now, let's see. Uh, let's write down probability of positive, so we'll enter in positive, given you have the condition uh, let's I don't know I guess XL is bound and determined to Do not what I want. All right, let's do a text. All right, so that's point uh, seven five. All right, uh, and the next one would be. Positive uh, given not condition. Again, it doesn't want me to. Okay, so if you have breast cancer, basically the probability that the test will indicate that is about 75%. The probability will not, if you don't have breast cancer, there's a probability of 10% uh, uh, probability the test will come back positive. I'm looking at only one test, all right, and I think this refers to mammograms. 
Okay, now, what's the probability that you have the condition given that you test positive? Bayes' rule says the following. Come back to uh, the overheads here. Uh, that's uh, this right here is this value here, and this right here is that value there. So, how did you do that bar after you were conditioned? Uh, well, there's on the right hand side, uh, if you do a shift, there's a backslash. Oh, okay. okay, so I take, let's see, this right here uh, times that, and I'm going to divide that by basically the same product that times that, and then I add to that, go back to the overheads, I need to take the probability of, you test positive, but you don't have the condition, which is this value, times the probability of the complement here, that is to be 69 over 70. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, let's go back here. Going to be this uh, times that, yeah, that's 0 0.098039. And this would be true for a lot of, um, diagnostic tests, you can come out positive without necessarily having the condition. This is where doctors are supposed to make their money. They're supposed to weigh all the evidence. They're supposed to take additional steps. You know, in a case like this, they refer you probably to a specialist, okay? Now, how do you get false positives? Well, reading an x-ray is an art and not a science. Okay, there's no, but I've talked about reading images, and the same thing happens with intelligence analysts who look at satellite photos. They read different things into it. In the, prior to the uh, Iraq war, uh, Intent, uh, an intelligence analyst saw things that turned out not to be the case. A lot of reasons for that. One was possibly psychological pressure, but the other thing is that just people look at images and try to infer what's going on and can be limited in inference simply because the image does not give you perfect information. All right. Uh, now, if you have an infection, I mean, one of the things the doctor would do is the doctor would take blood tests. They'd probably measure your temperature. They'd listen to your symptomology and use all that information, all right, to assess whether or not you have a quote unquote infection. The test may come out positive. All right, uh, which if in addition to everything else, that would probably lead them to prescribe you some antibiotics. Or the test comes back negative, all right. Uh, he or she may say, look, I don't think you have an infection. There's something else going on. They may pursue some other option. There may be something in a blood test that suggests something else. I mean, I don't know all the conditions that under which for example, your temperature can go up, but there are probably a lot of things, right? Uh, but the thing is that no one test could ever be definitive. This is not, I mean, there, this particular test, this particular data might change over time. 
they'll probably get better over time at reading images, but they'll never be perfect at it. Okay? I think we talked about that study of leisure land in, uh, in Orange County, where the, uh, they looked at 90 year olds, and one of the things they, let me read it here. One of the conclusions of the study was that about half the people with dementia over age 90 do not have sufficient neuropathology in their brain to explain their cognitive loss. Neuropathology would be an indication of plaque buildup on their MRI. So they have dementia, but the test is negative. So it'd be a false negative. In other words, the test itself says they're fine, but the cognitive tests suggest otherwise. All right. Um, and the other thing, I think they not in here, but you can actually have plaque build up in your brain, but not necessarily have obvious dementia. The problem is that the test is not the same as the condition itself. If you have a lot of plaque build up, you're probably going to have dementia. But it could be if you have plaque buildup, there may be compensating mechanisms in the brain has to get around that plaque buildup. That's for the younger generations to figure out about us old people, why we're getting all this. Is it just the plaque buildup 